I'd first obviously like to start today by acknowledging that we're on Gadigal country of the Eora Nation and pay um, my respects. Um, my family is from over the mountains, um, Rajari and Kamilaroi um, people, so Tamworth and Bathurst. Um, and I'd like to start by acknowledging that I'm a visitor, like all of us here, um, onto this beautiful country um, and what an amazing place it is to be. It's been a real privilege working on this country. Um, we've been lucky enough to be working with Uncle Charles Madden and Uncle, uh, and Uncle Chica Madden, um, and sorry, and Uncle Alan Madden, who has really guided this project um, and have supported us through this project and enabled this project to happen on their country. Um, the one thing I've sort of noticed um, as we've been working on country and spending so much time in this, in this beautiful place is that no matter how much concrete, no matter how much tar and bitumen gets poured onto this beautiful, beautiful country, this, this landscape and the, this, this history keeps speaking to us if we're prepared to listen to it. Um, and that's really what this project is about, listening to country, um, thinking about what's come before us, thinking about um, what that means for our future. Um, people like Uncle Charles, um, uh, sorry, like uh, um, Charles Perkins once said, of course, that we need to understand um, our history to know where we're going. Um, and that's really what this project is trying to get us to think about, um, about our past and about what has impacted us um, and about how it's framed us. Um, so the project Barangal Jara Skin and Bones is um, taken from the Sydney language um, and is referring to the histories that are embedded within this site, within the site of the Royal Botanic Gardens. Um, the project, of course, is looking at the, the, the Garden Palace, which was really Sydney's first major exhibition centre. And we've created these shields which literally mark the footprint of the building. Um, so we're sitting inside the building uh, itself at the moment. Um, as you can see, the building wraps around the gardens. It goes for what we would measure today is 250 metres um, in this north-south direction and 150 metres uh, in, in the east-west direction. And so we're sitting at the moment in the sort of southern transept of the building. This building, is, as we were saying, was Sydney's first real exhibition centre. It's the first time Sydney starts engaging with um, displaying uh, culture, the first time Sydney starts thinking about curating what it's meant to look like and how, and how people are meant to perceive what Sydney is, is doing and what Australia is doing. For the first year of the exhibition centre um, of, of the Garden Palace, the, the program was, of course, Sydney's international exhibition. Um, and that was the real reason to build the Garden Palace, was to host the International Exhibition. And for many of you who may know, International Exhibitions are part of the World Fairs, a sort of colonial network that happened right across the globe that was part of empire building, part of colonisation, part of the process of making sense of the empire, attempting to make sense of the world that they had colonised. Um, so, in this building, which was built in 1879 to host that international exhibition, which was commissioned by um, Henry Parks, we see um, international visitors coming from right across the world to sell their material here. Um, and also um, the, co the colonies of Australia, Victoria, New South Wales, Queensland, um, Tasmania and South Australia predominantly, um, selling their goods to the world um, and attempting to establish trade. Uh, of course, you've got to remember at this moment in Australia's history, Australia is enormously wealthy. Um, Melbourne is in fact one of the richest cities in the world. Australia is one of the richest countries in the world because of that extraordinary gold rush that we were sort of cresting on. And so it's at this moment that Australia decides to mark its, its relationship with the world, decides to try and make connections to the world. Um, and it really occurs through this program of this international exhibition. However, as we know, um, whenever one is making history, um, especially within a Western construct and a Western framework, it often comes at the cost of someone else's history. Um, and of course, the construction and manufacture and, and, and sort of propagation of Australia's believed history came at the cost of Aboriginal history. Um, and so while Australia was promoting its progress, promoting its wealth and promoting um, its, its technology, 
um, Aboriginal communities were being displayed as uh, as 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 savages um, as and as part of a dying race. Um, and so, in the section that we're that we're literally standing in here, there was the colonial exhibitions. I think this section here, we were just in Victoria. Um, down the end was South Australia, a small little section for Tasmania, and then New South Wales sort of kicks in around this corner. However, just over um, on the next lawn, on the top floor, was what was known as the ethnographic, um, the ethnographic gallery or the ethnographic courts. In those courts, of course, was the display of Aboriginal material. And as I said to you before, when we look at the lists of objects that were on show, it was predominantly men's weapons, or what was perceived to be men's weapons, um, and ancestral remains. Um, so, so body parts, skulls, and full skeletons being displayed next to weapons. And when we read the, the context and the curatorial rationale for why that was happening, of course, it's because Australia was keen to promote this idea that Aboriginal people um, were savages um, and Aboriginal people were eventually dying out. Um, and so promoting those, those stereotypes. And in fact, we find terms and the language around this idea of um, that it was really natural selection that insisted that this country would be taken over by a higher group of people, a higher race, who would come in and colonise this country and make good um, of this country. Um, however, we know, of course, that that notion, that stereotype notion of what Aboriginal people were being, um, how Aboriginal people were being displayed and talked about, um, conflicts with reality. Um, and, and that's part of what this project is trying to um, deconstruct and get us to think about in different ways. In, I guess at the very heart of this story is the promotion of terra nullius. So this idea that Aboriginal people, um, as we said, were, were savages and were dying out, this idea that we, um, that we weren't connected to the land um, generates and promotes the notion of, the, of, of terra nullius, the whole legal doctrine that Australia is, is, is founded on. And of course, what's interesting to remember is that while Australia is engaging in these global con conversations, these, glo these global dialogues, we can reflect and actually gain some insights in that. Um, of course, America, Canada is already engaging in treaties, um, has already engaged in, in quite um, uh, legal constructed relationships with its First Nation people. New Zealand has engaged in a treaty, but Australia doesn't engage in a treaty. Australia still remains today the only country in the Commonwealth that doesn't have a treaty with its Aboriginal people. And so that notion of, of, of undermining Aboriginal knowledge, undermining Aboriginal technology is very much at the heart of, of these issues and the heart of these stories. Um, one of the key ways that we've tried to address or redress that history is looking at this extraordinary native meadow that sits in the heart of the building. Some of you who might be familiar with the building, and I'd encourage you all to go down to the Palm House. It's only a small five minute walk down the, down the hill where you'll see some of the historical images of this extraordinary building. But at the centre of the building was this enormous dome, which is of course a, a, a completely um, Western archi archi um, architect sort of trope um, idea of, of capturing the universe in, a, in the dome, this idea of inheriting the dome from, from, from Rome um, and coming down through the imperial line to Australia where we had this extraordinary dome sitting over that section. And, and that sunken sandstone garden, in fact, is where that dome stood. Underneath the dome, of course, was Queen Victoria, um, residing over her, her extraordinary um, colony of Australia. Um, and she faced west, um, of course, to um, talk about that idea that the sun was to never set on the British Empire. And in that zone, what we've decided to do is plant out kangaroo grass. Um, and so kangaroo grass is one of the key um, grass species that Aboriginal people have been harvesting for thousands and thousands of generations um, to make bread. Um, and we know this from recent finds. Um, some of you might not be aware, but uh, it was only a number of years ago that in central New South Wales, a small little section um, near Brewarrina, um, a grindstone has been found. Um, and that grindstone has gr seeds embedded in it, seeds like kangaroo grass embedded in it, and that grindstone's dated at 32,000 years old, making Aboriginal Australians the world's oldest bread makers. Um, some of you might have read some of this story in Uncle Bruce Pascoe's book, Dark Emu, but this idea that Aboriginal people 
and we're, we're manufacturing, um, uh, we're, we're harvesting grains and producing bread here in New South Wales, what we know as New South Wales today, is an extraordinary thing that we all, we all should be very proud of. But like the Garden Palace, um, this history, this forgotten history of Australia has been neglected. Um, and so this idea of acknowledging the fact that Aboriginal people were engaged in, in, in agricultural technologies, engaged in making bread, is part of, is, is part of challenging this history of terra nullius. Um, Uncle Bruce in his book, and some of you have probably hopefully read that book, and if you haven't, I'd encourage every single one of you um, to get Uncle Bruce's book um, and have a read. And Uncle Bruce is the first to sort of say he's not um, inventing anything new. He's not writing anything new. He simply went back to old um, texts, old, um, old uh, explorers, old pastoralists, and looked at their diaries um, to see what evidence there was of Aboriginal agriculture. And he was, he was blown away by the wealth of information sitting in those old documents that people have, that we have collectively ignored for a number of years. And so he went through those documents and found countless, account, countless versions of Aboriginal agriculture. People like Sir Thomas Mitchell describes riding through nine miles, so 18 kilometres of monocultured grass. Um, he describes Aboriginal people, um, uh, 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 it's called haycocking and hay ricketing it together. So that idea of making bushels out of those grasses, um, drying those grasses on platforms, waiting for those grasses to cure, collecting those grasses and making bread. Um, and so you'll see as you go through that zone in, in the centre of the building there, those extraordinary grasses that come up that are ready for harvesting. And you'll see the grains. Um, and sometimes um, kangaroo grass has often been called um, native oaks as well. And you'll see why, because it's one of those key species that have been produced within this country for a long, long time. More recent studies have been showing us, of course, that grasses like kangaroo grass, um, if, if not burnt, controlled burnt every year with a cool burn, will actually decline and die. Um, and so what do we mean by a cool burn? We mean an annual burn happening just after the rains while the plant doesn't get damaged, a nice cool burn coming through and taking off all that dead grass and causing it to reshoot and regrow. Um, recent studies have, of course, showing us things that we've known for thousands of generations, that those grasses have grown with us. You don't grind bread for 32,000 years and don't get to know the plant that you're working with for 32,000 years. Um, and so we can see in that landscape that we've created there, of course, that very deep connection to fire, which this, which this project is so, so very much about. Um, my entry point to this project, of course, and some of you might have heard me say this story before, um, but when I was, um, ab about 20 years ago, I was um, trying to research where my family was from. Um, I was a, a, I think I might have been a first year art student at university, finding out about extraordinary art movements from right across the world. Um, however, I felt a complete disconnect to those histories. I didn't feel connected to those stories um, and I attempted to try and research from where my family was from. So as I said before, my family is Radjuri and Camilleroy through my mum, through my pop. Um, and so going over to the Australian Museum, I thought there'll definitely be something here from those two countries. If anyone knows um, the, those two countries, they take up a big landmass, Radjuri and Camilleroy take up a big footprint. Um, which we're pretty proud of. Um, and you would think that Australia's oldest collecting institution would have something from those regions. Um, however, um, as a young person, I went to that museum, asked to see material from where my family was from, only to be told that all of those objects had been destroyed in this fire that happened on this site. And for a long time, I guess I approach this story in a very Western way. This idea that when you destroy something through fire, that's the end of the story. Um, that when you, if you try and destroy evidence, if you try and destroy something, you throw it into the fire and that would be the end of the story. However, of course, within an Aboriginal context, fire is just the beginning. Fire is the start of something. Fire is the way we use to build up resilience within the landscape. Fire is the way we build up um, we, we build up the resources in that landscape and fire is of course the way we build up relationships within that landscape. 
Um, I've been lucky enough to work with Uncle Stan Grant, um, who has been teaching me language, um, Wiradjuri language. He's a, a Wiradjuri elder who has really been instrumental at the revival of the Aboriginal, of Wiradjuri languages. Um, and Uncle Stan, of course, has been a huge inspiration for me and this project over the years. And I remember when I first started talking to Uncle about the project, he reminded me, of course, that the Wiradjuri word for fire is win. Um, and then he said to me, but the Wiradjuri word um, for enlighten is winna. So you just add an A, a to the end um, of the word. And I remember um, we're sitting in the kitchen um, and I said to him, oh, Uncle, what do you mean, like enlighten? Do you mean like put more wood on the fire, you make more light, you know, turn the lights on? Um, and he was like, no, I mean light up your brain. I mean enlighten, start thinking differently. Fire is connected to the way you think. Fire is connected to the way you see the world. Fire is connected to the way you remember. And fire is connected to your knowledge. Um, and so in the centre there, you will hear through the soundscape Uncle Stan inviting us to winna naigunana. So again, winna, winna naigunana. So fire, that notion of fire starting. And winna naigunana is the word for remember. So Uncle Stan's inviting us all to remember these histories, remember these stories, and remember our country. Um, Uncle Stan, then, of course, you hear, um, he whispers this word, Winonaigunana, and then we hear um, teachers from the community of parks. So Uncle Stan um, took us back to the parks community, which is a community he's been working with for about 15 years. Um, so Uncle Stan has been working on language revival for about 40 years now. He was taught to speak um, Radri by his grandfather. Um, and then it was only about 40 years ago with our elders' encouragement that he started to rebuild that language, document that, um, put it back into circulation, start teaching people. And so um, on the weekends, Uncle Stan used to just jump in his car and drive out to communities, Radri communities, and start teaching. And the community of Parks was one of the communities he started teaching with, uh, working with about 15 years ago. And of course, Uncle Stan really wanted to go back to Parks, not only because it's where he's been working for a long time, but of course, Henry Parks commissioned this building. And Henry Parks is, of course, where Parks is named after. Um, and so he wanted to go back to that community. So you'll hear Uncle Stan say, Winone Gunana. Um, and then you'll hear one of the teachers in, those, in the Parks community put the word of a lost object, so one of the objects we lost in this fire, um, put it into a complex sentence. And so, for instance, the one I often remember is um, Winonegonana Marara Garan Garan. So, remember the designs on the shields. So, these shields that we see here, remember the designs that we used to carve on them. And then you'll hear a young one say, just remember the shield. So, Winonegonana Garan Garan. And then you'll hear these students, these teachers, and Uncle Stan reminding us of objects and reminding us of the complex place they occupied within our cultural, within our cultural world. So remember the edge of the knife. Remember the sound of the boomerang in flight. Remember the feel of the club. Remember the uh, edge of the knife. Um, all these ideas are being, being posed to us, this idea of remembering. Um, and so Uncle Stan and that notion of using language as a way of remembering our culture, as a way of acknowledging our culture, has been really important. Because even though we lost thousands and thousands of objects um, in this building, even though we lost so much of our, of, our, of our material culture, it's never been let go. You know, we can remember that, we can remember those objects through our language, we can, we can acknowledge them, and we can feel them in our, in our language. And so you'll notice that we've got eight different languages that occupy the entire footprint of the building. We've mainly worked with Southeast communities because Southeast communities were the most deeply affected. By that 1880s era, that notion of colonisation had really pushed through um, what we recognise today as New South Wales and Victoria and Tasmania. Those communities were very deeply affected. Um, and most communities in those regions were completely displaced off country um, and, and unable to maintain cultural practices. So people weren't able to go and pick grasses. Um, people weren't able to go and collect wood to continue carving. People were unable to speak their language. So those southeast communities have been deeply affected by this history. And so you'll hear this extraordinary gift of language that we've been given. Some of you might not know, but of course the whole southeast region, so the Murray-Darling and you know, the coastal regions of New South Wales and Victoria, 
is home to over you know, 80 different nations. So 80 different language groups occupy that area. Um, and so Wiradjuri is just one of those stories. Um, as we sit here, we can constantly hear um, Gunditjmara um, language washing over us. Um, this is an extraordinary gift that we've been given um, by two um, of the language people from, from Gunditjmara country. You'll hear Vicky Cousins, um, who's an extraordinary artist in her own right, um, but also Joel Wright um, singing to us. Um, so Joel, in fact, has written, and both of them have written songs from scratch. Um, so again, using their language in very complex, complex ways, um, putting language in sentences, using long language in songs. Um, Joel wrote a song about shields. And so shields, of course, are extraordinarily important to this project. Um, the reason we chose shields, of course, is because this site, um, the one thing we know about this site is this site was a ceremonial ground. Um, and we know that because it was a ceremony that was, um, uh, that was, that was uh, documented by um, the British um, in, in the early 1770s. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting really bad with my dates now. Um, and we know that those images were in fact showing um, men with their shields, holding their shields, performing with their shields. And so we wanted to reoccupy this site, site with shields. Shields were one of these, these ideas that have been promoted about this idea of the noble savage. Um, however, I've been lucky enough to work on a number of projects now which are starting to show that shields, of course, are not this Western world of shields. It's not this term that we constantly use as shields as part of war. Um, in fact, we were lucky enough yesterday to have one of those key researchers, Carol Cooper, remind us that shields, of course, were used to record stories. They were engraved, they were designed. They were so carefully made and looked after that they weren't part of this notion of warfare. They were part of a deeper ceremonial construct that was about communicating, about telling stories, about retaining culture, about people recording their histories. And so these shields that now we use to reoccupy this site, these shields are now protecting this site, protecting these stories and protecting this history and reminding us of something different. And so here you can hear um, Joel singing this song about Malka. Malka is the word, Gunditjmara word uh, for shields. So he's talking about the process of making a shield, collecting the wood, going into country, looking after those trees, finding the right tree, bringing that tree back, um, bringing the bark back, holding that bark over the fire, um, getting that Malka strong with fire, um, and then slowly engraving those designs and using that shield to protect your family, protect your culture and to protect your country. The next song that you'll hear afterwards is um, Vicky Cousins. Um, so some of you would know Vicky is an extraordinary um, artist, Gunditjmara artist, who has been part of the movement of the revival of possum skin cloak making. Um, so Vicky's been working really hard for a number of years on um, reawakening this knowledge of possum skin cloak making. Um, and in the southeast, the process of making possum skins was vitally important, as you can imagine. Um, when a child was born, um, especially in, in Wiradjuri country, when you were born, your family would make you a small possum skin rug. So this idea of maybe four pelts get sewn together and then inside you'll design those designs. As you grow up, your family slowly makes it a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger as you grow. Um, and then when you're old enough, you start looking after that cloak yourself. And that cloak, of course, is what protects you. It's what keeps you warm. It's what keeps you dry. And of course, it holds all that family knowledge of all those designs that are embedded within it. So you're literally carrying around um, all your family lineage um, on your back and holding it close and it's protecting you. Um, and of course, in, especially for Radri people, when you die, you're wrapped in your cloak and you're buried with your cloak. So they're extraordinarily important objects um, that had almost, you know, a lot of people would say that it was an extinct practice. It wasn't happening um, and it had finished. And yet, thanks to the work of people like Vicky, that knowledge was woken back up again. Um, and I'm sure many of you have seen the extraordinary possum skin cloak projects that have been happening right across the country. There's been waking up knowledge. It's like the language itself. It's coming alive um, and building up um, a new sort of cultural knowledge within our communities and reminding us that nothing ever is lost. 
And I think that's that notion that Uncle Stan has always been teaching, um, in particularly teaching me, that idea that nothing's ever lost. Um, from going to a point in his life where language was banned, um, where he in fact watched his grandfather in, imprisoned um, uh, for speaking language in public, um, to a point now where he is running courses at university, he's teaching at schools, he's invited to come and speak and, and tell, talk about his story of language. Um, and I, I think one of the most important things for me was when Unc came on site and he was blown away by the fact that here in the middle of Sydney, um, we're listening and celebrating these eight different languages. We're enabling, we as a collective group of people are enabling this language story to be told. Something that would never have been possible when he was a young one, when he was a kid. And he was really marvelling at what's changed in our community that has enabled these languages to be spoken. And Uncle Stan stresses that it's not Aboriginal people that have changed. Aboriginal people have been wanting to speak our languages the whole time. That's never gone away. What's changed is the wider community has enabled language to be heard. People are interested in hearing our languages again. People are letting that happen. And so that's a real shift within the landscape which, really, which he was really inspired by and took away from this project, which I hope you can as well. So, um, so the project is really made up of, and I'd encourage you all to really walk through the perimeters of the building. Um, so you'll get to understand this enormous building and the enormous scale of loss that occurred here. Um, I'd also encourage you all to look at the history of the Garden Palace. The Garden Palace, in fact, was Sydney's first cultural institution. It wasn't just Aboriginal material that was lost here. It was material, it was the first colonial archives, um, it, was the, it was the beginnings of the art galleries, it was the beginnings of the museum. So every cultural institution in Australia, in Sydney, has its kind of legacy coming out of this building. It was the, it was the place for the Mineral Museum, the Technological Museum, the Linnaean Society, all the, as I said, all the culture, all the um, colonial documentation was held in here, so the first census ever conducted. Um, enormous stores of information and I would argue that every single one of you is connected to this building in some way or another. That somehow your family, your history is embedded within this site. That we all lost something when we lost this building. However, this building is trying to get us to think about our lost histories. And I'd encourage you all to think about this idea that if we manage to lose this extraordinary building, this building which really defines Sydney, it was really Sydney's first time that it announced itself to the world and started engaging in world politics that was 250 metres long, 150 metres wide, 65 metres tall, an extraordinary building. If we were able to lose this massive building, what other histories have we lost? What other histories have we forgotten? What else have we let go of? Um, and that's where I'm encouraging all of you now, today, to think about this landscape and think about our country, think about where we come from and think about why it's important to hold on to those stories. Um, and of course, as Aboriginal people, we've been so used to understanding that Aboriginal history has often been forgotten. Aboriginal history has often been the history that's been left out of the picture. When you pick up a history book, um, you know, everything starts in 1788, that idea that everything begins at that moment um, when Australia was, was, was discovered. Um, denying the fact, of course, that Aboriginal people are the world's oldest living culture, living on this country for thousands and thousands of generations. Um, and so what I guess I'm interested in this project is, is that as, as a group of people we've become so bad at history. You know, Australia has become so unable to kind of see the, the complexities of our own history that we're starting to lose massive chunks of our history. This building is one of them. And we can use this building as almost like a Trojan horse, that if we can forget, if what else have we forgotten? Um, and I'd encourage us all to think about this extraordinary place that we live in. So even in this, this state of New South Wales, that we call New South Wales today, um, people like Uncle Bruce remind us that even in this state, we have not only the world's oldest bread makers, we have the world's oldest man-made structure, the brewer and a fish trap, and we have the world's oldest ceremonial burial at Lake Mungo. We have all of this history coming out of this little patch of country. You know, just this southeast, this extraordinary area. 
Um, boomerangs are found at 14,000 years ago, um, for, that were made 14,000 years, years ago in, in Victoria. The first sort of notion of starting to think about you know, flying machines happening here in this country. And yet, if you were to study archaeology, you'd never get posted to rural New South Wales. You know, that would be, that's not where you get posted. That's not where people look at studying. That's not at where our research is, is focused. It's focused overseas. And so hopefully we can start realigning our ideas to think about this country in a different way, think about our landscape in a different way, and come to terms with where we're from and, and, and address that idea that I started with, which Charles Perkins you know, famously commented, that if we don't know where, we're, where we've come from, we have no idea where we're heading. Thanks.